How's it going you guys? It's Scott with Everyday Home Repairs and we just closed out five years on YouTube and also crossed the 100 million view mark, which are both amazing milestones, but I do feel like we're just getting started. Now, part of this process is I'm in the comments every single day and getting all your guys' great feedback, which is increasing my own knowledge over time, but it has been hard for me to go back and share that information with you because it's kind of after the fact, right? Once the video is out there in the world, I'm getting feedback on it, but I'm not able to go back in that video and then apply additional lessons learned or additional nuggets that came from the audience. So that's the whole premise of this video is top 10 tips for DIY electrical projects. And most of this information is coming from the viewers and all the great feedback. So we'll push through this list quickly and I guarantee you, you are gonna learn something along the way, even if you've seen most of my videos in the past. Tip number one associates to education, code, and even knowing if you need to pull a permit. Now you do need to educate yourself if you're gonna take on these projects around your house. Do you need to pull a permit for the things that you're doing? And also, what version of the NEC electrical code are you on? Code is updated every three years, but then it's applied differently throughout the United States and in Canada. If you need a little help finding what revision level you're at for NEC, you can check a link in the description. I'll have a link to the United States map that's put out there and it shows each state labeled what version or year NEC code they're on. And then some states like Illinois, we actually go down to the county or municipality level calling out that version of NEC code. Additionally, for DIYers to up their knowledge, I do recommend, I think the Black & Decker Complete Guide to Wiring. This is the eighth edition. So it'd be for the 2020 to 2023 revision. I think this is a great start. It has a ton of great information. And I'm not sure why, even though all this information is online, Having this in paperback form has really helped me. I can sit on the couch and kind of go through it. One of my favorite sections is actually the circuits section. So it shows wiring of different types of circuits that you'll run across. A super common one is like three-way switches. And if your light is over here or power's coming in over there and where are your light switches located at, how are you gonna wire that up? Where are the traveler lines going? Which we usually always need a refresher on because we just don't do it that often. So I highly recommend this one. You'll see it in a link also below in the description. So below the video, a link to our Amazon store under the electrical section. This is the book. This is the guide that we list out towards the bottom after our other recommended tools for DIYers. Now, number two goes to my favorite type of outlet. And we will call out that these are actually technically called receptacles, but I'll probably just keep defaulting to outlets. This one is my favorite. So I have done a bunch of different videos, breaking down, opening up, looking at the internals and comparing Leviton, Eaton, Legrand, and Hubble. Now this is the commercial grade Legrand. It is my favorite. This is a non-tamper resistant and non-tamper resistant is about two to $2.50. So comparing that, this is just a generic, I think it's an Eaton Decora series residential grade. I do not like residential grade. I do not recommend residential grade and this dovetails into a feature I do not like which is called backstabbing where you can put 14 gauge wire directly in the back you can backstab it press that in and that is a one and done feature it is supported by home builders in the industry because it's a speed it's a labor saver but I don't like it uh, in terms of its durability over time so I do not recommend residential components and this is also consensus with our viewers and feedback now with that said, I do want to give a little bit of focus on Hubble. Hubble is a great brand and in terms of the brand that's brought up the most by professionals, licensed electricians, master electricians in my comment section, Hubble. Hubble is always brought to the highest standard. The thing about Hubble and why I don't recommend it as much is because I go to the Home Depot, the Lowe's, the Menards in my area in terms of getting my components and Hubble's not carried by any of those. Hubble is more of your supply house type of brand. So that is a electrical supply house really serving the professionals in your area. So you would have to be comfortable going in there, working with them, and usually they will not have what you need in stock. Not always, but at least in my area, they don't have a ton of things in stock. So you'd have to know exactly what you want, put in the order, and they usually can get it next day, but it's just one more step in the process. So if you really wanna step up to that, 
do investigate Hubble, and we'll actually talk more about the Hubble component, which is my go-to in a couple of tips. Now, number three is a quick one, and that is just be a little cautious when you're upgrading your light fixtures. So this is an integrated LED ceiling light. It's super thin. There is some convenience to this from a weight and just the overall profile, the thickness of it. But when we upgrade to integrated LEDs where the lights are integrated, the light emitting diodes, the LEDs are usually in a ring, that's what's providing our light, there's no bulbs. This is okay for a while, but let's say you're getting eight to 10 light fixtures to update the look of your house, you're putting those throughout your ceiling, and then in two years down the road, those start to fail. The challenge is these are gonna be a certain color, these are gonna be a certain design. So two years down the road, are you gonna be able to find the same style, the same color to replace that so the look is all the same? Or are you gonna to have to start thinking through replacing them all again to get the same look? These are the challenges with some of these integrated in addition to brightness. You're not able just to get a new light bulb and change the brightness. Some of these you're able to change the Kelvin scale, which will change the warmth of the light. Is it a 2700 Kelvin yellow warm light or a natural light to the blue scale of a 5000 Kelvin? Usually you can change that, but you can't necessarily change out a light bulb from a 60 watt equivalent LED light bulb to a 100 watt equivalent LED light bulb and get more light from that same fixture and then just service that by unscrewing a light bulb and screwing a new one in. I'm very wary of these type of light fixtures in my rentals because if I have simple lights going out, no longer is it changing a light bulb, it's actually changing a light fixture. So just keep that in mind while you're shopping for vanity lights and ceiling lights and fans because a lot of them are all going integrated nowadays. So tip number four associates to a very common piece of feedback and that is electrical tape. This is 3M Super 33. This is the go-to. This is the original electrical tape, the creators of electrical tape. And that is, do you use this to wrap outlets or light switches when you're installing them? And maybe even on wire nuts. That is a common piece of feedback. You did everything correctly except for you didn't wrap the outlet. That's something that I hear quite often. So I've made a video on this in the past. I've asked it in polls a couple times. In a poll I just put out yesterday, over 5,000 people gave feedback. And if we take out the 10% of people that say, hey, I don't do electrical work, you're somewhere around two out of three so they do not use electrical tape to wrap outlets or light switches. And one third says they do. Now, if you have a metal box, this is kind of the one exception that I give. If I have a tight one gang metal box and a large GFCI outlet, okay, then I might do a couple wraps with electrical tape, but other than that, I'm really not using it. That is similar feedback that I get in the comments of those type of polls, and that is, well, if I'm doing it in a metal box, yes, I will, but plastic, no way. Number five is just calling attention to, if you're living in a manufacturer or a mobile home, or maybe family members are, they probably have these things called self-contained devices. So this is an outlet, it is self-contained. It's basically the outlet and the box in one. It's self-contained. And the way this works, the Romex actually comes in the back, you strip off the insulation, you place your hot, neutral, and ground in the appropriate lanes, and then you're supposed to press it down with a specialty tool where the spades will actually cut the insulation and make contact with the two conductors in the ground. Man, this is just not my favorite design. It is approved, it is allowed, and it's still being used today. So if you have a manufactured mobile home, I try to swap those out sooner rather than later because it's just, this is definitely prone to failures. I've had one fail in a manufactured home that I had purchased in the years past where they plugged a griddle on the countertop into that outlet and just fried the outlet. Kind of a dangerous situation. So self-contained devices, in manufactured and mobile homes, just try to stick away from those. Tip number six is investing in some better tools. So if you're going through your house, you're updating your house, or you got a big project coming up, you feel confident taking that on, you know you can do it safely, you have the knowledge, get some better tools. And they don't have to be expensive. So I always have an outlet tester. This is a simple one made by Klein Tools with your GFCI test button uh, integrated in. Then I have my non-contact voltage tester, the NCVT-3P. Specifically, I like the 3P by Klein Tools. It has a light on it, comes in super handy when you're turning off the power. 
my ECX screwdrivers, which is that hybrid screwdriver I've talked about on the channel before. It fits perfectly into your terminals and it combines the best of all worlds, a Robertson screwdriver and also a slotted or flathead screwdriver to make sure you can get the additional torque when securing your wires to your outlets. Highly recommend. And then stepping it up to some nice wire strippers. These I purchased over a year ago and they are made by a company called Knipix and they are a hybrid wire stripper. So they have those broad jaws in the front for twisting wires and kind of serving the purpose as your clients or your linesman's pliers. I'm not getting these out very often anymore with these hybrid wire strippers. So these are a little expensive, but man, they're nice single hand operation with the locking scroll wheel here and just are a really nice set of wire strippers that are gonna help you out on your projects. So number seven goes into making, again, an investment. And that is with a outlet that's becoming more and more common in our homes. And that is a NEMA 1450. This is a 240 volt, four prong, very common for electric car charging. In 2021, about 3% of all car sales in the United States were electric, fully electric cars. In 2022, that has jumped to 6%, and I don't think that trend is stopping anytime soon. So what that means is more of us are gonna need an outlet like this in our garage to effectively charge our cars and do that in a reasonable amount of time. With that said, this is not something you wanna cheap out on. I've done two installation videos, and in both those videos, I've installed like a $10 to $15 NEMA 1450, and that was a mistake. You want the best materials and the most robust design on an outlet like this. I've seen many examples of heat and failures here at the screw terminals. On some of these cheaper models like this one, you really, a lot of people would probably install that with a Phillips head, and you are not gonna get the appropriate amount of torque needed to hold that six gauge wire in there per the design of the manufacturer. And yes, you do need a torque screwdriver to make sure you're getting the manufacturer specified torque. This is something I invested in this year just to make sure on this type of application I was getting the right amount of torque. But specifically from the viewers, you guys gave me feedback and said I need to upgrade to a Hubble but not just any Hubble, the HBL9450A. So I went out and I got one. It's about $75 and compared to about $15. So you are really stepping up. But as soon as you take it out of the box, you really feel and you can see it's just a whole nother level of quality. And what I like the most is on the back when you are actually torquing down your wires, your six gauge wires, one, you could start them out by getting them torqued down with a 316 Allen key. So you're gonna be able to get a lot more torque and then you can use your 316 Allen bit on your torque screwdriver to finish that off. One additional thing to call out, remember, the wires here are gonna be stranded. So if you take on this project, do it safely. And also when you're torquing that down, you do need to work that wire and do multiple cycles of torquing down because if you just torque down and you do not work that wire, it can come loose, start generating heat and cause an issue in your house. So be careful if you're taking on that project or more likely if you're hiring it out, call out exactly the HBL 9450A for the exact outlet that you want for that installation. Now number eight goes into one of the best upgrades I think you can do to, especially a dark space, and that is the small six inch LED can lights are wafer lights because they're only half of an inch thick. Why are they half of an inch thick? Because no longer when we're spacing these out throughout our living space, do we have to worry about where those trusses are in your roof line, right? Because you used to have to put these big old can lights in the middle and you definitely couldn't be hitting any of your trusses and that limited what you can do. Now, since they're only half of an inch thick, you actually don't have to worry about that because even if you're just cutting out the drywall, that is enough thickness for these to attach these small tabs and secure to your drywall. And then you have the integrated junction box that then you'll daisy chain together. Now, this is integrated LEDs, and I told you before to avoid those, or at least that I was trying to avoid those. So why are these okay? One, the design, right? So almost every brand and every maker of this standard six inch and also standard four inch 
pretty much has this white border and then just this lens on the inside. So it's gonna be much, much, much easier to match in the future if you need to install a whole new unit because one of those failed on you. So the chances of matching are gonna be much better. And two, I actually do get extras for these. So I have a couple extras on any of my projects. I try to put those in the closet if I'm selling a home or if it's my own rental or my own home, I store those away just in case I'll need them later on. But if you have a dark living space, if you have one of those old living rooms with like switched outlets so you plug lamps into, I love that upgrade. I've done a whole video on it and I think that just absolutely changes the living space for a very, very minimal investment. And then number nine goes into kind of getting creative. So if you want to add an additional outlet to your living space, maybe you want to put a little charging station in the corner like I did on one of my Airbnbs, and maybe you don't have access to your attic or maybe no access below, maybe you're on a slab, a concrete slab, there are ways to avoid the drywall and painting that we all dread if we're damaging or cutting into the drywall or our wall surfaces. You actually can just hide things below the trim. Now this type of project is our most popular video on the channel. It's over six and a half million views now and that's really showing how do I get an outlet daisy chaining off an existing outlet, how do I get that further down the wall without going in the basement, without going in the attic, and not having to do a ton of drywall or paintwork? It is possible. You just need to know how to hide that cut line below your trim surface so you can minimize the amount of other work that you have to do. And then number 10, you probably guessed it if you haven't heard it already in the list and you watch any of my other electrical videos, and that is Wago lever nuts. Instead of wire nuts, I just think these Wago lever nuts are perfectly suited for DIYers. Things like this, where I need some temporary lighting, I use the Wago inline splices. So I'm able to connect that up with a neutral and my hot side, connect it up quickly. Now I have a 100 watt LED bulb on a socket giving me light to a space that I'm working on. And then when I'm done, I just take those right off and then I just leave those in my truck so I'll have it whenever and they're completely reusable and incredibly convenient. I think they shine in a lot of different electrical applications, but if you have a light, a ceiling light, a fan, anything overhead, a vanity light where you're trying to hold on to the fixture and also wire something together, especially if you're bringing three wires or more together, man, Wago Lever, there's no comparison. The likelihood of you getting a solid connection, secure, no issues in the future with a Wagner lever nut is infinitely higher compared to a wire nut, especially for us DIYers that maybe don't have all the skill set and all the reps of using those wire nuts and knowing some of the tricks of the trade. Now I carry these with me in a Milwaukee pack out setup. I carry two wire, three wire, five wire, and then those inline splices, the Wago. 221, so the 221 lever nuts, 2401. That is the inline splice, and it's actually pretty new in the US that you can get that. One point of confusion, you can look at these three wire, both Wago 221, and there's a considerable difference in size. The smaller one is most likely what you want. So this will be approved 24 gauge wire to 12 gauge wire. So it's gonna meet the vast majority of what you're doing. And it is much, much smaller. And then this larger one is the Wago 221 613 and it goes to 10 gauge. So it is much, much larger. So really for most of us, we're looking to get the 413s the 412s, those would be the 2Rs, and the 415. And no, Wago actually doesn't sponsor their channel. This is just how much I believe in these things. I think they're awesome for DIYers. When I switch, I never turn back. And that is what I stock, and I just have them for any of my projects. You'll find a bunch of different kits that are great to start off over in our Amazon store. And actually, there's one with the 2-wire, 3-wire, 5-wire, and that inline splice. It has all four of those in the 12 gauge size that you need. And that'd pretty much be a perfect way to start off and see if you like Wagos as much as I do. All right, so we covered a ton of ground. One, just thank you guys. Thank you guys for the support. If you're still watching, I really appreciate your support. And here is a link to the full playlist. All those different electrical videos we talked about many, many times I said, oh, I did a video on that or oh, I did two videos on that. This electrical playlist, you'll be able to scroll down through and see all those videos if you need anything for your reference. So thanks for joining me on this video. Thank you for all the support and we'll catch you on that next video.
Take care.